Okay. So good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it was really great to see the numbers that we've got. I'm uh, so grateful to, to you all um, for, for joining us this evening. My name is John Turner. I'm the Chair of Trustees for the Salisbury Museum. And um, uh, I've only been doing this role for about a year, but just in the time that I've been involved, it's been absolutely extraordinary to see what has been happening whilst the world is in the most terrible state and the things that have been happening in the world. It has been almost the opposite uh, within the museum, despite having to open and close, open and close and lockdowns and restrictions. We seem to be going from strength to strength, um, thanks to an incredible team doing an incredible job. And this evening, um, Adrian is going to share with you the plans that we've got for the future, which much as I would love to um, take some of the highlights, I'm biting on my knuckles so as not to steal any of um, Adrian's thunder and do that. So um, without further ado, all I'll say is um, I will introduce you to Adrian Green, our director. And Adrian, thank you very much, very much looking forward to um, hearing you talk about the future. Thank you, John. Hopefully, John, you can see my image, which is of the King's House. I can't. You can't. OK, I will um, see what's happened there. Right, OK. I can. Well done. Excellent. Great. That's what we like to see. Something odd. There. The technology there ago just failed us. <laughs> anyway, right. Um, thank you very much for the introduction, John. Um, so this evening we're going to be talking about Pass Forward, which is our redevelopment project for Salisbury Museum. Salisbury Museum for Future Generations is the tagline, how we used to refer to the project, but now the, the shortened version of that is Pass Forward. And this is our exciting sort of capital redevelopment project to transform Salisbury Museum with the support, hopefully, of the National Lottery Heritage Fund um, to the tune of about 3.2 million pounds, but this is going to be a 4.4 million pound project. Um, but what I'm going to do this evening is I'm, the project is vast. It's huge. We've been working on it for a, a number of years. I'm going to sort of start to, with a beginning, an introduction to how we've come to this point. I briefly go over how we've arrived here. Um, and then I'm going to sort of drill into particularly the capital element of the project and how we're going to transform the building, um, particularly focusing on the, the works themselves and the fabric of the building. I'm going to touch on some of the other elements. I'm going to touch on the, the objects that we're going to display and, and some of the community engagement activities. But there's a whole raft of other things I could focus on there, which will take up another uh, sort of hour of your time. So what I'm going to do is, is really just focus on that, that component, if you like, because that's the, the element that I think people are going to see when they see the Transformed Museum open in 2024, which is when we hope the capital works will be completed. So starting with the King's House. This is the logical place to start this presentation. Fabulous grade one listed building in Salisbury Cathedral Close opposite the west front of the cathedral. Now the museum's been in this building since 1979 um, and really um, the story of the museum in the 1980s was one of actually expanding into this building. We moved from uh, our previous premises which was in St Anne Street in Salisbury. We've been there since 18. 1864, the museum was founded in 1860. So we'd mass huge collections and they've run out of space in, in, in St Anne Street to display those collections. So King's House was the sort of logical sort of place for the museum to expand into. And of course, it used to be a teacher training college that closed in 1978. And the museum took on a 125 year lease of the building in 1979. So as I said, expansion into the building was the main focus of what the museum did in the 1980s. And in fact, when I took over the museum in 2007, many of the galleries in the building dated back to that period. So we had archaeology displays dating back to the 80s. We had a fabulous Pitt Rivers Gallery. Um, we have a costume gallery, which is, of course, recently being changed. And also the Salisbury History Galleries. All of those spaces were originally put in in the 80s. So by 2007, when I took over, they were looking rather dated. They were a little bit of a, a time walk, if you like. And it was almost this sense of the museum becoming a museum of a museum. So what we decided was that we needed to do something about that. We, we are a charity, we're an independent museum, we need to attract paying customers. And if you've got a, a product which is looking old and tired and looking a little bit dated, you've got to upgrade it if you're going to want people to come through the door of the museum and in fact secure the future sustainability of the museum. 
Of course, the other thing that was going on in the background back in the, the earlier part of the 21st century, if you like, back in the early noughties, um, was the idea around a new visitor centre at Stonehenge. And we were aware that English Heritage had great plans to put in a visitor centre. And we knew that this would hugely impact on our collections and on our displays, not least the fact that we had a Stonehenge gallery dedicated just to that monument. And that if a visitor centre opened at Stonehenge, that gallery would become redundant. So there are all these sort of issues buzzing around. So we put together a master plan for the King's House. And in fact, we thought at first it was going to be a 10 year plan to transform, transform the entire building. And with this idea that we do like one project a year and we'd get through all of this thing really quite simply. And we'll get a big grant from the Heritage Fund. And it'll all be very straightforward. Of course, it was nothing of the sort. Um, the master plan was completed or rather the first draft of it was completed in 2008. And it landed on my desk roughly at about the same time that we had the financial crash. So the idea that we were going to be doing some big sort of fundraising campaign and transform the museum overnight was, was not really feasible and that this scheme was going to take a lot longer to achieve. And within the master plan, there were 10 projects, as I said already, and the one we decided to focus on was on the archaeology displays. So we decided to do the Wessex Gallery. And as I said already, one of the main reasons for doing that was because um, of the Stonehenge Vista Centre, opening just up the road and the redundancy of the Stonehenge Gallery um, and the need to actually do that kind of in, 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 in sympathy, in, co you know, in collaboration, if you like, with, um, with Stonehenge, but also um, Wiltshire Museum also wanted to change their displays too. So there's this sort of groundswell of kind of feeling that we wanted to all update our displays and do them in collaboration with each other. Um, so this was, this, this was one of the things that really influenced the decision to do this space. Of course, the galleries, as I said already, were, were, date, were dated. And also these collections, these archaeology collections are of national importance. They're designated by the Arts Council. So there is, a, there is a, as important as collections you will see in a national museum. Um, so that's what influenced the decision to tackle this project first. And we hadn't had a huge sort of track record also with fundraising for capital projects for a long time since the 1980s. And we hadn't done a major capital project with a heritage fund. So um, we approached them to the funding and um, we secured 1.8 million from them and raised 600,000 pounds in match funding to put this project together. And as I'm sure some of you listening will know, um, the gallery opened in 2014. And it succeeded in moving forward what we wanted to do. Um, we attracted more visitors to the museum. Our visitor numbers have gone up to an average of about 30,000 a year from about 20,000 a year. And um, it's, it transformed also our engagement with schools, as you can see from this slide here. And also to a certain extent with the local community. We have a, a gallery which is of a high quality that respects the really important collections that are displayed within it. But of course, it's only one small part of King's House and the offer that we have here. And in doing this, it created a nice problem for us to solve in that we created this fabulous new exhibition space. The rest of the building suddenly looked even more tired than it did before. So those galleries that dated back to the 1980s, particularly the Salisbury History Galleries, which in fact I think were slightly older than the archaeology displays, um, looked even worse. And in fact, visitor comments, for example, on TripAdvisor would say, just been Salisbury Museum, seeing the fabulous Wessex Gallery. It's a shame about the rest of the museum. And obviously I'm oversimplifying that, but but that was the general feeling and the feeling that I personally had about what we'd achieved. It only sort of bit off one part of the, of, of the problem and much more needed to be done. So we went back to the master plan and had a look at how we might do more projects and do more of them in one lump. And we started discussions with the Heritage Fund again in about 2014, 2015, about what we wanted to do next. And in fact, one stage we had a grand scheme to try and do the rest of the building, both galleries and behind the scenes. And that was roughly about a 10 million pound project. Uh, Heritage Fund, unfortunately, were unable to support us with that because there's been a massive problem with lots of projects like us and organisations like us applying for funds from the Heritage Fund on one hand, but also the amount of money coming in from lottery playing has in fact been going down. So lottery have had less money to give away and more people applying. So these big capital projects like the one that we wanted to originally go for really fell on huge difficulties trying to get them over the line against some of the national competition and some of the really big nationally significant projects were happening. Um, projects like Salisbury Museum got squeezed out. So we had to downscale our plans, but even then we still hit some of the same problems. So it took us, I think, actually in the end, four attempts to go to the Heritage Fund, including that first massive bid, to try and get this project over the line. 
um, which is absolutely incredible. We just had to just keep sticking with it. And they were telling us that the project was okay, but it was the problem with competition. So we just kept going back. And eventually in 2019, we succeeded in getting what's known as a first round pass for this project, the Pass Forward project, which I'm going to describe. And as I said already, that's at the moment a promise of 3.2 million pounds against a 4.4 million pound project. So we have to raise 1.2 million pounds ourselves to try and see this across the line. So what is this project all about? As I say, the original scheme, I'm not going to talk about, but that included a new massive temporary exhibition gallery and you know, refurbishment of stores and offices behind the scene. This project focuses primarily on conservation of the building, upgrading of the rest of our permanent displays, and also a significant community engagement program that's going to sort of redefine our relationship, particularly with the local community. And what I want to do here is I just want to actually zoom in so you can actually see this in more detail. So hopefully you can see there, this is a plan of the ground floor. And what I'm going to highlight just here is all the major interventions that we're going to make to the building. And in fact, those are highlighted on this slide in pink or sort of reddishy kind of pink kind of colour. So as you're looking at this, hopefully you can see my hand cursor moving around. You've got the ground floor. There's the front there. You've got the car park there, the entranceway, back lawn there with the statue of Augustus standing in the middle. And the Salisbury History Gallery is on the northern side of the building. And that's one of the major areas we're going to change with this project. That is currently that space there and that space there. But as you'll see from the label, it says three spaces to be transformed into renewed History of Salisbury Gallery. What we are going to do is we're going to knock a hole through the wall, and I'll show you this in more detail in a minute, and take in the area which is currently our lecture hall at the back of the building. That space when the museum was a teacher training college, while the building was a teacher training college, was a chapel. So we're going to actually join it up with the building properly. Some of you will know that to get into that space at the moment, you have to go outside the back of the building and then go in through a separate door. That will no longer be the case because it will become part of the Salisbury History Gallery and have a, a hole in the wall joining those two areas together. So this gallery space on the northern side will occupy about 350 square metres. So it will be of an equal weight and an equal size to the Wessex Gallery on the southern side of the building, which is that bluish space you can see over there. So that's one big chunk of the project. Then over on the southern side of the building, we've got an area that used to be our Stonehenge Gallery, which closed when we created the Wessex Gallery, currently used as storage. We need to remove some of the material that's stored in there at the moment, and we want to turn that into a small event space, kind of space that will be perfect for a class of students, uh, say 30 students, school children, or it could be used for some of our object handling activities, projects like our um, reminiscence clubs, our, our um, conversation club for people with dementia. It would be the perfect space for small group events on the ground floor of the building at the front. In fact, you can get into the space from a fire exit straight out into the courtyard at the front of the building. So it has its own dedicated access, which will be perfect actually for small school groups. What's also wonderful about this is that that space in the building, when this building was a teacher training college, it was used as part of the model school but where the teachers used to train or practice on local school children back in the 19th century. So in fact, that space was originally built as a classroom. So there's a wonderful kind of link there with the previous use of the building. So that will be that area that I've highlighted, the education room. Um, also right over on the far southern side of the building where it's labeled the volunteers mess room, that is that exactly what that will be. That area used to be one of our staff room spaces. We no longer use it anymore, but we will turn that into a volunteer cloak room. So there'll be lockers in there. There'll be seating in there. It will almost be a social space for our volunteers. We do not have anything really like that at the moment that is accessible to people on the ground floor of the building. Then finally, just looking over on the northern side again, we've got refurbishment of toilets. And also this area here, it says new lift and stair. So we're going to put there a lift for the first floor and also a dedicated protected stairwell. And that's because, moving to the top of this, 
On the first floor here, you can see there that red square is again where the new lift is going to be. We're going to have where the costume gallery currently is. We're going to convert that into a dedicated multifunctional event space. So we need to have full access to that. So we need a lift, we also need a separate protected stair because it will house up to 90 people. So we need to have an emergency escape that is separate with a stairwell that's adjacent to it that's also protected and fire rated. So that will be installed in that area there. The costume collection, of course, will be reintegrated or displayed as part of the Salisbury story on the ground floor. That does mean there will be less costume on display, but it will be integrated into the main narrative and the story that we are trying to tell. Moving across the main front of the building here, we've got on the first floor there the ceramics gallery. That will be redisplayed, and I'll come on to a little bit more about what we're proposing to do there later on. And then finally, where the Wedgwood collection is, which is right, again right in the centre of the building, we will have a new natural history gallery. And again, I'll explain more about that shortly. You also note that we're looking at putting in a stair lift in the stairs that are adjacent to that space. Uh, the point is, you're thinking, why are you doing that when you're putting a lift in? Well, for anyone who knows this building really well, there are lots of floor level changes. This building has been extended so many times over the years um, that each bit they added in, they didn't think of putting it in at the same level. It's always at a different level. And yes, you might be able to put ramps in some places, but in some areas it is just not possible. So the lift will open up access to the northern side of the building, but it will not unlock access to anywhere else. It won't even unlock access to the King's Room, to the Ceramics Gallery. So if we wish to increase or improve access to that space, we would need or have to put a chair left in, in that's in a stair that leads up to it in order to facilitate access. It's unbelievably frustrating. So ultimately to get full access to this building, you would have to put in either a lot of really long ramps, change the floor levels or put in lots of lifts in different parts of the building. It's the only way that that can be achieved. Um, so that's a slight frustration, but nothing much we can do about it really given the age of the building. I should say that um, we do have listed building consent for this project now that came through, I think earlier this month from Wiltshire Council. We don't need planning permission because we're not making any major changes to the outside appearance or to the footprint of the building. In fact, we're making less changes to the footprint of the building than we did with the Wessex Gallery, where we took over an external courtyard. We're not doing anything like that with this project. So this building consent has been granted. It's one of the things the Heritage Lottery Fund like to see in place before we make our application. So that's one thing that we've achieved, which is great, because it means that everything I'm talking about this evening, there is permission to do it. Any hole I mentioned, we're going to bang in a wall, any window we're going to change or anything like that, the permission is in place. So that was really just an overview of the interventions, if you like, we're going to make into King's House. Now, what I want to do now is drill in in a little bit more detail into the designs and the content of the new galleries. So this slide here shows you the new Devonish Bradshaw Salisbury Gallery. Um, we've named it the Devonish Bradshaw Salisbury Gallery because we've had a very generous and significant donation towards this project from that family and as a consequence of that we've, we've been more than happy to uh, give them naming rights to the new gallery space as, as a mark of our thanks for, for their generous offer um, and I will actually touch on one of the other things that the family are going to do to us they do for us later on because they've also included with this a very generous gift of some objects to the museum too that link to Salisbury's history the Devonish family were quite an important family in, in Salisbury in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, so the slide I'm showing you here shows you the three principal rooms. So as you're looking at it, um, we're looking kind of to the north. You've got on the right hand side there, the area that's currently our, um, I can, again, I can zoom in here, that area there, which is actually currently part of our Salisbury gallery. That space there will become the medieval room. So that will deal with the history of Salisbury from the 13th century all the way through to the 15th century. Okay. The middle room here, this will deal with the period from the 16th century through to the 19th century, effectively from loosely speaking, the Tudor period through to the Georgian period. 
and in the final room over here, which is the space that is currently our lecture hall, that will become our Victorian and modern Salisbury History Gallery. So collectively, these are the Devonish Bradshaw Salisbury Gallery, and then within that, there are these three rooms that deal with the chronological narrative. So this deals with the 800 year history of the city. Effectively, it deals from 1220, that pivotal moment when Salisbury moved from Old Sarum, a new Sarum was founded, all the way through to the present day. And as you can see, it will broadly deal with that story chronologically. I hasten to point out before I go any further, and anyone's wondering, the object you see there is not a full scale Spitfire. It is, in fact, a model of a Spitfire that we're proposing to have made and hung from the ceiling of the later history room to commemorate the fact that in Salisbury in the Second World War, there were lots of small workshops where local people manufactured Spitfires as part of the war effort. We have very little that's tangible. We have a lot of oral history, photography, but we don't have anything tangible to show for that. We don't have a Salisbury Spitfire, unfortunately. If anyone knows of one, please let me know. But I doubt we'll be able to put it in the gallery. So we'll have a model of one, scaled down model, hung from the ceiling. It will be incredibly light because I doubt the ceiling would take the weight of anything heavy made of metal or anything like that. It's almost certainly be made from wood and appear to be made of metal. Um, so I have to point that out because I think it confuses people when they when they see it. So that's a plan there of the galleries that I've just described <laughs> or rooms. And for those of you who know the building, just to orientate you, this is slightly confusing because it's around the other way. So the, the chapel area, if you like, or lecture hall area is on the right hand side there. And you've got on the left hand side there the, the room that I described as the medieval space. The corridor there um, is the area that we, 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 we as staff refer to as the rat run because it links the fire exit here that goes outside that you have to normally walk to to get to the lecture hall at the back with one of our entrances by the coffee shop, which is down on the left hand side. So that corridor there will still be the principal way that you get in to these galleries and the main entrance to gallery will be through the existing door, which will be upgraded with a ramp, uh, which we don't have there at the moment. We have one for the exit to that gallery that was added a couple of years, I think, before I started here. And then we will have one there actually, so people will be able to get into the space if they've got any mobility problems. But I think one of the things you can see from this instantly, and you will have seen in the previous slide, is that unlike the galleries at the moment where just like the old fashioned displays in the archaeology spaces, heavily encumbered, lots of timber, lots of structure that's going to be stripped back. So one of the things you'll be able to appreciate is actually the layout of the building. Just like Wessex Gallery, you get that wealth factor when you walk in and see the extent of the space. This won't quite be the same, but you will be able to appreciate the actual core fabric of this building. And there are things like, you know, there are lovely sort of Gothic pointed arches and things like that in these spaces, which were added in the middle of the 19th century. It needs to be appreciated. The window in this gallery here, the middle gallery, is absolutely fantastic. But at the moment, the giant is displayed, and of course, he has a wall around him to protect him from the light that's coming through that window. And uh, um, it obscures your appreciation of how fabulous that, that piece of architecture is. There's a beautiful sort of moulded arch that goes around just inside the window. You don't really see these features. So I think one of the things we want to get out of this isn't just a, a wonderful representation of our collections and a, and, a, and a story of Salisbury's past, but we want people to appreciate the fabric of this building. Hopefully, you will also be able to get fabulous views through this space all the way through to that end room. So in fact, the object you see down here, which you would have seen in the previous slide, that looks like a rosette, is in fact the Salisbury giant, who we've decided to place in the room at the end, because of course, he will no longer touch the ceiling. In the current space, his head is almost touching the ceiling of the room. In this space, he'll actually look quite small. Uh, um, and in fact, uh, we, if you join the, uh, the, 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 this uh, um, session earlier, you would have heard us talking about the fact that originally he was 14 feet tall, but was actually reduced to 12 feet, I think in the old museum so they could fit him in. So there's a bit of debate about whether we should actually bring him back up to his original height again, because we'll have the space to do that. So that just gives you an overview, but I'm now going to go into even more detail. Um, so this is this is an artist's impression of what 
The first room, the medieval room, dealing from the period from the 13th century through to the 15th century will look like. Of course, this is just an initial drawing. This is not a final design because we've got a lot more detailed design to do once we get through to the delivery phase of this project. So next year, in 2022, there'll be more detailed design done. At the moment, what we're doing, we're just getting a sense of where the cases need to be, what the content of those cases will, will be, and what stories we would like to tell. But the finer detail of actually exactly how the objects are going to be laid out, we have not got there yet. We are looking at capacity, what will fit into these spaces, but we are not doing the final detailed design. And things like colour, things like that have not been decided yet. So this looks very, very similar in feel to the Wessex Gallery, I think. And I don't think we actually want that with this space. We want it to look different. We want it to have the same kind of underlying kind of design aesthetic, I think, but it will have a different approach and colour will certainly be part of that. So one of the things you'll be confronted with when you first go into this space is a central dis uh, display case. And that display case will have the drainage collection on display. This is one of the core collections of Salisbury Museum, acquired, in fact, in 1860s is one of the first things that the, the, the men who founded this museum, the gentlemen of Salisbury, acquired to establish the museum. The drainage collection came out of the old water channels that used to run through the streets of Salisbury. They were effectively open sewers and people were dying of cholera as a consequence of them. They were filled in the 19th century and in the process of doing that, hundreds of medieval artifacts were uncovered. And these artifacts give us a, an incredible insight into daily life in Salisbury. In the 13th century, 14th century, 15th century, 16th century, 17th century, they're all accidental losses, objects that belong to everyday people. Spoons, knives, uh, spurs, buckles, pilgrim badges, you name it, there are objects there. Each one has an individual story. Obviously, we don't know what any of those stories are anymore. They've been lost but this collection provides this incredible snapshot and insight into daily life. So the point here, you're probably thinking this isn't all medieval, it's not. This gives you an introduction to the entire gallery. It's like an introduction to the people, the everyday people of the town. So this is a brilliant opportunity really to launch the gallery, launch the space, launch the story of the museum as well, which is, which is, which is part of. Um, it's also an opportunity where we might be able to talk to local people about objects that they would like to see displayed here. There's an element perhaps of co-curation of co-creation as well in terms of how this space could be arranged. Um, something we will do as part of the development of the project over the next year or so. So that's a really important moment. Over to the right here, you can see there's a projection. And what we're hoping here is have a film that will orientate people. Hopefully it will take people on a journey, perhaps an aerial journey from Old Serum to New Serum to the site of the present day cathedral and the present day town and hopefully take people back in time. It would be lovely if we could do something that takes people on a modern day journey from that location all the way down to the modern city, but also strip away all the modern accretions and go back into the medieval period. So people are grounded back in 13th century. So this is a plan of the space. So hopefully you can see there, the, the arrows sort of indicate a route that one might take around the space, just indicative. But you can see, hopefully, and again, I can zoom in, if I've got the power to do so. There we go. You can see there that we're starting to label up where things will go on display. So you can see there the drainage collection in the middle section there, an old serum, a new serum, Clarendon there, very important medieval site. Some of you will also be thinking, wait a minute, doesn't that date also from before the 13th century? Indeed it does, but um, I feel that it fits with the story that we're trying to tell in this part of the museum. Obviously, there's nothing relating to Clarendon in the Wessex Gallery, it needs to go somewhere. We will have a section there on Laverstock pottery, um, also on pilgrim badges over here. You'll notice as you look here that we've identified where interactives are going to go. INT05 is obviously an interactive on pilgrim badges that will talk a little bit about where different badges come from in different parts of this country and also Europe. The collection covers you know, lots of different places and talks a lot about where people travel to in the past. So that will be an interactive that explains that a little bit more. Um, got a monitor there. You can see a film that will talk about animation or rather show that how war was manufactured in Salisbury. Again, this was so important in terms of the 
uh, economy of Salisbury in the Middle Ages, yet we have very little tangible evidence for it. So using a V will help us to overcome some of those problems. Um, you'll see over there also a film about stonemasonry, a story of how the cathedral was constructed is terribly important, but of course stonemasonry is still something that takes place here today. So we want to bring in those kind of modern day voices into this story too. Some key objects, for those of you who know the galleries, you will be familiar with some of these, but uh, one of the most outstanding objects in this gallery, in my unbiased opinion, uh, is the uh, lovely chess piece that you see there on the left hand side. 13th century object made of walrus ivory, almost certainly manufactured in Scandinavia um, or perhaps Northern Germany, um, an accidental loss that was found in Ivy Street in Salisbury, part of the drainage collection covered in the 19th century, core part of the museum collection. In fact, it was purchased by William Blackmore, one of the founders of the museum, um, but he is a king piece from a chess set. Um, I mean, what a loss. I mean, the person who lost that must have been unbelievably frustrated. That's all I can say. Um, but he's a beautiful piece of craftsmanship and will have pride of place in that display about the drainage collection. So he'll be one of the first objects that you see when you go into the gallery. As I've mentioned already, we have fabulous material. So from Clarendon, that, that wonderful carved head that you see there is from Clarendon Palace. Um, uh, thought to, well, originally I think it was suggestion that this face or this head was supposed to represent death. Uh, but I think more recently, in fact, well, one of the volunteers at the museum suggested, in fact, he's probably somebody sneezing, which I think is, is probably correct. Um, but it's a really finely executed piece of craftsmanship, that, that, that card in there from Clarendon. Of course, medieval tiles are manufactured in Clarendon. We have huge numbers of those, far more than we have on display at the moment. So we would like, like to get more of those out of display to sort of reflect the opulence and the grandeur of that site just to the east of Salisbury. And then pilgrim badges, which I've touched on already. That, that badge that you see there is Our Lady of Tomberlane. Uh, it's a badge showing um, Mother Mary and the baby Jesus, I think. And it comes from an island just off the coast of Normandy, Stroke, Brittany, near Mont Saint Michel. That's where the shrine was. That's where that badge was acquired. So somebody acquired that, came to Salisbury, accidentally lost it. In fact, it was found, I think, not in the 19th century, actually, that example. That was found actually in the 1980s by some mudlarks working alongside the River Avon. Um, so it's an important recent acquisition, but not on display at the moment. Again, more fabulous medieval objects we've got there. A uh, piece of lava stock ware manufactured just outside of Salisbury Town Centre, um, face jug. Um, the middle piece thing there is a piece of painted medieval glass from Ivy Church Priory near Alderbury, um, quite close to Clarendon as well. And then finally there, uh, Limoges Cross, uh, found under a paving slab in Monpesson House in Salisbury Cathedral Close. Uh, dates back to the Middle Ages, 13th century, beautifully made object in my view, completely thrown away in its current display context. I mean, most people overlook that object. It is an incredible object and deserves to be appreciated more, as do all of these things. Um, and the final point here is, of course, most of this, as you've probably noticed, is archaeology. This material, this medieval material, is all part of our designated archaeology collection, but it's overlooked, or rather not always appreciated as much as it should be, because of the fabulous material we have, prehistoric material we have from Stonehenge, and all the other fabulous riches that are in the Wessex Gallery. Um, but I feel very strongly that this collection is just as important and needs the same level of appreciation. So now jumping forward, this is the, the middle room, if you like. This is the room that covers the Tudor, the Stuart, and the Georgian period. So we're looking here at the 16th century through to the early 19th century. And here, of course, we move away from the archaeology and we're moving more into the historical material. We've got sort of documents we can display here, complete objects that we can display here, costume that we can display, huge variety of different materials. Also, the painting collection is something that we'll be able to reveal. So again, I'm just going to just zoom in a little bit there. So you've got there the Downton fire engine, for example. Uh, lovely. Uh, I think that's an early... 16th century, I think, uh, mayoral chair that we got in the collection there, made by um, Humphrey Beckham, who was a local joiner in Salisbury. Um, we've got, as I mentioned, costume. We've got the sedan chair, currently on, on display upstairs next to Dr. Neighbour's surgery. Um, but the thing I just want to highlight here is along the back wall there, that purple space that you can see, that 
is an area where we will be able to display paintings. So from the 18th century onwards, we have some fabulous works of art in our collection. Current Salisbury History Galleries, of course, they're not displayed in context. In fact, the gallery is a bit of a muddle when you think about chronology. It does not follow a chronological thread at all. And some of the first things you encounter are the paintings, and then you see the drainage collection, then you see the giant, and you see other things from the medieval and more recent periods. It's, it's thematic. It's not chronologically arranged. Here it will be chronological. So that wall there will have our Turner watercolours, for example, on display. Um, also, um, of course, we've got a drawing by John Constable as well. We'll be able to display there too. But the important point is that we will also be able to borrow things from other museums and display them in that space. It will be a flexible space. So for argument's sake, if we were to borrow Constable's uh, Salisbury Cathedral from the Meadows, the rainbow from the Tate Gallery again, we've obviously had it here twice, but in the past, we've had to display it in our temporary exhibition galleries and had to build exhibitions around them. But what I would like is that in the future, if we borrowed that painting again, which we have a right in perpetuity to do so, it would be displayed here in the context of the period that it links to. It would mean we wouldn't have to build a huge display around it. It would work better. It'd be wonderful to have the opportunity to display it within these galleries for say a six month period. Um, in context alongside our Turner watercolours and other items that relate to that period. So that was a dream of mine. Hopefully if the environmental conditions are right in this gallery, if the security is right in this gallery, we will be able to do that. So a plan here showing you again, very similar to the previous slide, like slides that I showed you, um, how this is laid out in more detail. Um, note that this isn't quite the same as the drawing, the artistic reconstruction that I've shown you. So yes, the Downton fire engine is in a different place. Uh, the sedan chair and things in a slightly different place. The chairs in a slightly different place in the middle there. But the point is that there will be these larger objects on open display in the centre of the room. And then around the perimeter, there will be the display cases. And again, some of those themes, in fact, only this afternoon we were discussing where some of these objects are going to be displayed, they may not be necessarily displayed exactly how you see them here. But yes, there will be sections, for example, on local manufacturing and trade, for example. Um, hopefully, it doesn't look like it's spelled correctly. Um, political reform, obviously touching on things like the Reform Act. Um, we've got things that now are interactive down here, for example, Interactive 7. We've got a, a door of a prison in Salisbury, uh, the, old, the old jail. Um, we will from the Georgian period. So we're hoping to put that on display and actually have it so you can peer through the door and see something behind. Um, it could be a film, it could be, I don't know, it could be some illustration. We haven't decided yet, but it will be an, in, an interactive experience. So just like the previous space that I show you, you can see here dotted around films, interactives, and also in that fabulous bay window that I mentioned earlier, we will have a bench, we'll have a seating area, and we'll have activities that people can try. Some highlights again. So two of these items here aren't things that we can regularly display. We've got a wonderful uh, Tudor finger ring there with 19 diamonds set into the outside of it. That's currently kept in our safe. In the middle there, we've got a couple of pistols made from Richard Parrott of Salisbury in the 18th century, uh, acquired with the support of the Art Fund a couple of years ago. Um, again, we don't have a permanent home for those, for those at the moment. And on the right-hand side there, the Nicholas Snow clock, which is normally on display in our costume gallery, that will be integrated into the story of Salisbury. And as I've touched on already, painting again will be a key part of this space. So just zooming in there, got there, wonderful watercolour by John Buckler of the front of this building um, from the earlier part of the 19th century. Uh, this again used to be on display in the costume gallery. Um, you will note in this watercolour that the front door to the building is actually in the centre of the space and not actually over in the archway, which is the door that we use today. Also note that there's no wing on the southern side of the building. Wonderful painting there by George Beer of Miss Fort of Alderbury House. Uh, fabulous painting. We've actually used this on some of our fundraising literature because she has a wonderful kind of uh, come on expression on her face. Uh, so we love this portrait and again it's, it's stored away. It needs to be more regularly seen. A painting there is um, of Ashcombe formerly um, home of Cecil Beaton, 
but obviously this painting dates back to the 18th century. Uh, the building has been much reduced today, um, but Beaton actually owned this painting and he said it was his favourite possession. In fact, he liked it so much that he took it with him when he moved to Reddish um, in, in Broad Chalk and he kept it till he died. And the fact the museum acquired it directly after the, the sale of his property uh, in, the, in, the in the early 1980s. Uh, and then finally that drawing there, of course, is the John Constable that we own of St Anne's Gate, uh, dating back to 1811, which was his first visit to Salisbury. And then finally, this is the lecture hall space, the former chapel, and two views there of how it might appear. And as I've said already, sounding a bit like a broken record, this is obviously subject to huge change. But one of the key exhibits here will be the Scout motor car, car manufactured in Salisbury in 1912. So over a hundred years old, manufactured on Churchfield, a car that we acquired, there's only two of them left in existence. We acquired it about eight or nine years ago now and will form the centerpiece of this display. A huge, wonderful example of Salisbury sort of manufacturing prowess. That drawing there was done, I think, before the idea of the Spitfire. As you can see, there's a drawing of the Spitfire there in a panel on the wall. But in this visualization here, of course, we have the model of the Spitfire hanging from the sea. But also you get to see where the Salisbury giant will sit in this space, and that's him at scale. Um, he's not going to be sitting in the back of the car, I hasten to add, so it does look like in this drawing, like he's sitting in the back of the car. He's not. There will be space between the car and the giant at the end. And here's a plan. Um, same principles as before, and just going to sort of zoom in a little bit there. So you can see that I think one of the most interesting things here will be how we um, display our photographic collection. We have a vast photographic collection in the museum, We've got the Salisbury Journal's photo archive, our own collections dating back to the 19th century and many other private collections too. A lot of them have been digitized. So we will have a touch screen there, AV15, that will allow you to interrogate that collection. And I think what that will help to do also is give access to these collections but also help to tell some of the stories we just simply won't have space to tell. So things like, you know, 1906, there was a massive train crash at Salisbury Station. There'll be images there showing you that event. There was a massive flood in Salisbury in 1915. Again, unlikely we'll have anything else tangible to show for that, but there'll be photographs showing that event on that touch screen. I also suspect that it'll be all organized Kind of geographically so we have a map of the local area you'll sort of pick a street perhaps a street where you live or somewhere that you know that will then bring up any images we have linked to that space for example so yeah Salisbury station click on that you'll then get images showing you it going back over time including those of the train crash from 1906 so that I think that will be a really important feature in this gallery you'll also see over on this side here military story is going to be really important both from the first world war and from the Second World War as well, with the story of the, of the Spitfires, but also how it impacted on the local community. Um, we'll have oral history, contemporary collecting. We're obviously interested in stories like the Novichok incident, an incident that people don't really want to talk about at the moment, but we need to have something tangible really in here, and oral history might be the way to do it, to kind of bring that story to life. It had a massive impact on the, on the city, of course, completely overshadowed by COVID-19, but very important. The story of the teacher training college, the founding of the museum is really important. And along this back wall here, there'll be a massive feature on local manufacturing and retail. Um, you know, we have, ton we have shop signs, we have tons relating to local business and local shops. In fact, we have too much, too much to display. So we'll have to sort of really focus in on a few key stories there to bring that to life. Again, paintings will be a key part of this. On the back of that wall that have the interactive, um, we will have some of these on display. These again are just a snapshot really of some of the fabulous material we've got. Um, poultry cross there on the top right hand side under repair by William Callow from the middle of the 19th century. We have there on the left hand side an engraving from the 1830s showing Minster Street, one of the old water channels, actually running through it there. Quickly going to zoom in. See there, a man kind of fishing something out of it. Dread to think what he's looking for. If he's going to consume it, he won't live. Um, the wonderful Mrs. Rideout, uh, the Coombe Express, a lady who used to transport items from Salisbury Market to Coombe Bissett uh, with a couple of donkeys. Um, it's painted by um, 
think of Henry Brooks or Frank Brooks, I can't remember which either the father or the son, I'm really embarrassed that I've forgotten that, um, but really key item currently on display in our ceramics gallery, but that's something I think ought to be brought down into the displays on the ground floor. And then finally, paintings that are on display at the moment, we have quite a few of these by uh, um, uh, Louise Rayner, showing Salisbury in the 1870s, 1880s, very sort of sentimental views, a sort of chocolate box kind of views, biscuit tin kind of views of the city, uh, but really sort of bring it to life with all the sort of characters and the figures that you see, particularly in the foreground. So there'll be a section dedicated to that. And then this links back to the naming of the gallery, uh, the Devonish family, who they owned in the later 19th century, um, Little Durnford Manor in the Woodford Valley. And Matthew Devonish, the gentleman standing, sitting there on the left hand side, he was also the uh, manager of the Wilts and Dorset Bank in Salisbury, which is today Lloyd's Bank. And um, so he actually came wealthy enough as the bank manager to buy the manor house in Little Durnford. And that's where the family lived in the later part of the 19th century and the earlier part of the 20th century. And so I think this is very interesting because it will provide a very useful case study, if you like, linking together a kind of a story of a local family and the link between town and countryside, a gentleman who owned an estate, but also had business interests in the city. And in fact, his, um, his granddaughter, uh, Dorothy Devonish, wrote a book about the estate, uh, about, about it in the 1930s and her life on the estate and also the many people who worked there as well. So we have a very useful insight into some of the, the lives of the everyday people who worked on the estate. So the family have given us paintings, um, but also they're giving us items relating to the Wilts and Dorset Bank, personal items that relate to the manor house itself. And also this fabulous painting down here um, by Wilfred Gabriel de Glen, uh, who was an impressionist artist, British impressionist artist who lived in the Chalk Valley. Uh, he was a local chap. And um, that's a painting of um, Little Durnford Manor that you can see in the, in the middle distance there from the top of Camp Hill or Snaky Hill, as I'm sure most people know, know of it. Um, it's a fabulous oil painting, and I think it, it will form, you know, one of the centerpieces alongside the portraits and the other family items on display in the gallery. Now, this is jumped completely from one thing to another, but I've already touched on this already. But one of the other critical things here is, and particularly in terms of more modern stories, is that we we need to sort of do some contemporary collecting. We need to gather sort of modern stories about what's happening in Salisbury today. So I mentioned Novichok, but obviously there's also what's happening to us now. There's COVID-19, there's the impact that that's had on Salisbury specifically. So imagery and oral history gathered actively over the next couple of years is going to be a really important part of this. So, I mean, these are just photographs that I took of what was going on in Salisbury. But the thing that fascinates me, I think, particularly is the, this, uh, uh, this piece of graffiti, which is no longer there. You know, somebody has taken the cash, right, self-isolate, take care, look after all. Uh, it's a rather strange thing to do, isn't it, to put a piece, to face a piece of, you know, artwork with a piece of graffiti telling you to take care of yourself um, during these times. Um, but it was quite quickly washed off after lockdown. But I'm sure most of you who walked around the town would have seen things like the play areas being closed and obviously all the, 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 the pictures to support all the key workers. And then, of course, the social distancing queuing of supermarkets in the town. I find this photograph fascinating, though, because... I'm convinced, in fact, that I'm sure everyone took it a lot more seriously back at the beginning of this. And this was actually taken last summer and the early days of the lockdown. Um, I'm sure the gaps between people standing in the queues has got, have got smaller. So already I feel this, this photograph is an historic document. One thing I deliberately didn't talk about is the display of the Salisbury giant, because at the moment we haven't actually decided exactly how we're going to do it. So. You would have seen that drawing there, or that illustration there showing you the proposal. And he looks rather lonely, but we feel that he is part of a crowd. You know, he was used in public celebration in Salisbury going back to the 15th century. He's pretty much seen every big party that's taken place in Salisbury going back over that time. Of course, as an object, he no longer dates back to that time. Of course, he was used throughout that period. He's been upgraded. He's been changed. There's very little of him that's original. He's been recycled a lot and, and repurposed, if you like. And I imagine his function slightly changed as well. Originally, he was a mascot of the Tailors Guild. He was then bought by the museum in the 19th century. He then was sort of taken out on any occasion for a celebration, you know, a coronation, a peace celebration, anything like that. The giant formed part of it. He's part of the crowd. We need to bring the crowd to him. 
So at the moment, we're looking at proposals for what to do. So one idea might be to surround with a huge group of people, a series of figures from Salisbury's past. They could be people maybe dating back to the 15th century. They could be more recent people. Perhaps we have people from today. Perhaps we get the local community to vote on who they think this giant should be surrounded with. But it does need to be populated. We could use historic costume as well. We can have painted figures. We can have three-dimensional sort of 3D printed figures. There, there are so many different options here. But what we're going to do is engage an artist to help us with this. We're also going to talk to local people about how we should present this. But we do feel that perhaps this idea of a kind of Sergeant Pepper's album cover kind of approach might be the way to do it. The idea that's been voted out, though, is the one on the right hand side there is the, perhaps the more sort of stripped down, kind of very museum-y kind of display with a few mannequins. I think this needs to be something that celebrates Salisbury as a place. And you kind of get confronted with a lot of the historic characters that perhaps you've met and seen throughout your time in the gallery. Because, of course, this whole thing, this whole space is about people. It's about the people of Salisbury. It's, it's, it's our Salisbury, it's their Salisbury, it's the visitors' Salisbury. And we need to celebrate that. And I think this, this moment will help us to achieve that. So I'm just gonna quickly now just touch on a few other changes. So one of the important points here is that how are we gonna get the car in and out of the space? Well, we're going to put a new door in. This is the only change we're going to make to the outside of the building is put some folding doors that look in to the inner sort of internal courtyard, if you like, of the museum. So that will be a substantial change. It will also mean, excitingly, that we'll be able to get the giant out again. So there is just the possibility, conservation allowing, weather allowing, that we might be able to continue to use him as he was originally intended, because he's been excluded from any form of public celebration since he came into this building in the early 1980s. In fact, he was bricked into this building. We can't get him out. So I'm hoping through this project and through those doors in particular, we will be able to address that oversight in the future, making part of public celebration again. So finally, just moving up to the first floor, um, we've got here, we've got the ceramics gallery. So the whole idea here is, in fact, to tell a potted history of Britain. At the moment, the collection focuses in, in on the 18th, 19th centuries, on the connoisseur material that we've got. What we'd like to do here is connect those collections with our earlier archaeological collections and tell a story of the history of ceramics from the earliest pottery made in this country 6,000 years ago all the way through to the present day. So it'll be like a timeline dealing with all the major changes in pottery production in this country. There are very few museums in this country that can do that. National museums, yes, but not many local regional museums. I can't take any credit for this idea, unfortunately. It came from the archaeologist Julian Richards, who came to visit us last year to borrow some objects for a very similar display he's doing elsewhere. And we were chatting about it in the space, and this idea kind of landed. And we thought this would be a brilliant way to unify those fine decorative arts that we've got with the more historical material we've got. We've got some of the earliest pottery made in this country in our collection. So we need to make a virtue of that. And of course, we've got fabulous material from the Bronze Age as well, from the Roman period, from the medieval period, the Laverstock pottery that I showed you earlier, and more recent material, for example, from Verwood, alongside this, this material that's made from across the country, from the finest kind of manufacturers, um, Chelsea, for example, Bow, um, all the major potteries, Staffordshire, it's all represented there. And of course, most of that was collected by the founders of the museum in the 19th century. And here we've just got some, this is, these are the more detailed drawings, but this gallery in particular is gonna have really large display cases down each side of the room, display those collections to best effect. And also those cases will come back closer into the wall. So there'll be more space in the center of the room. This room also needs a lot of conservation work. And that's one thing, again, I've not really touched on is that this building needs a lot of TLC. Um, the ceiling in this room will need attention because it dates back to the early, 17th century and was originally added as a room to entertain royalty. James I dined in that room in the 17th, early 17th century, 1610 and 1613. So we need to make sure that room survives for the future. The bay window at the front as well is in terrible condition and needs a lot of stonework replaced. It's all limestone. Some of there's some ironstone, there's iron cramps in there. They're all slowly fragmenting, causing huge problems. So we need to address that sooner rather than later. That's a very important thing that's underlying this scheme. And then the final room, of course, is the Natural History Gallery, currently our Wedgwood space. So Wedgwood collections will be integrated 
into the main narrative, if you like. So they'll be integrated into the narrative that we're telling next door about pottery production. So this room then is freed up to get out some of the collections that we haven't displayed since we were in St Anne Street in the 1970s. And in fact, going right back to the Victorian era, we've got fabulous taxidermy. We've also got fossil collections, you know, dating back millions and millions of years, mainly from the chalk in Wiltshire and, and from some of the limestone areas just to the, to the west of Salisbury. So we, we, we need to tell a story there about climate change and about our human intervention with the local environment. There are species and animals there. And I question whether you will find many of them today. I mean, there are fish caught out of the River Avon, which are absolutely colossal, which were caught in the earlier part of the 20th century. Do we have or do we have our examples of that today? Do, should we get people out doing sort of environmental monitoring and things like that based on this collection, engaging with their local, you know, flora and fauna? I think this is incredibly important. It's very much in the zeitgeist at the moment. It's a whole area of work that we're not really engaging with at the moment. Terribly important. So some really exciting things, I think, will come off the back of this, the creation of this space, which is really quite a small space in the museum. But as I say, potentially very exciting. So finally, I mean, the whole thing area I haven't really touched on at all is the engagement aspect of this. And I mentioned this at the beginning, that the whole purpose of this project is about sustainability of the museum. And it isn't just about, you know, numbers of people coming through the door of the museum. Um, it's, it is about the business case, but it's also about our engagement, excuse me, with the local community. The whole point about this project, it is transformational, it's transforming our permanent displays and our collections. What we will get out of this will be a museum that for the public will look completely transformed, it will look brand new. But alongside this, even more importantly, there is a whole programme of community engagement. Now I've touched on already that with how we create some of these displays, we will be talking with local people about the content of those displays. We will be undertaking oral history projects. We will be undertaking photography projects. We will be talking about which objects people think that we should be displaying. What we want to do is redefine our relationship with the people of Salisbury. The museum, although it's in this fabulous location, in this fabulous building, is often seen as something that's not for Salisbury people. It's a tourism place. It's somewhere where people come to from outside of Salisbury. We need to realign that. We need people from the city to take ownership of this place, feel engaged with this place, and feel that the collections and the stories that we have here reflect their histories. This is just so important for the museum. And I want this project to be the basis for redefining and realigning that relationship. So what we have in the future is a museum that is sustainable because it has this active engagement with, in fact, the very community that set it up back in the 19th century. So I think that's probably the best place to stop. Adrian, thank you so much. I think your, your enthusiasm and passion is um, infectious and it's, it's really exciting to see it. But that last point is so important is that with the really strong business plan that, it, that supports all of the visuals that we've seen, we will really be pushing out to new audiences and new areas. And um, as you said, every single um, way that we can dial up uh, new audiences and new people is going to happen. So it feels great. Thank you very, very much. That goes all the way through your team and we're, we're feeling it. And that's why this is such a success at the moment. And I think that's an important point. It's not just, you know, I'm, I'm just the tip of the iceberg, a very small tip of the iceberg. And there's a whole huge team of people working behind the scenes to make this happen, both the team appointed by the museum, um, you know, project curator, and we've got volunteer coordinator, we've got activity plan coordinator, you know, what administration as well being dealt with as well, all, all a part of the project. And then the professional team outside of the museum, it's huge. Um, so, I um, mean, back, back compared with the Wessex Gallery, that was a very small project. This is vast because it touches on absolutely every aspect of what we're doing. Brilliant. Thank you. So, um, you, you've timed that absolutely perfectly as well, which is um, very clever. We now um, are able to ask if anybody would have any questions. Uh, the technology that we joked about earlier is way beyond me now. So I'm hoping that uh, that will now be taken over. I think over this is a, a chat function. So I think if people would like to ask questions, I think they can, they can submit written. I think, yeah, in the main, if you want to ask questions, use the Q&A function, which is um, at the bottom there. And then I will pass those questions through to Adrian. So we have a few questions for you, Adrian. 
Um, first of all, a couple of sort of related questions from Ronald um, about engaging audiences. Um, so first he asks, um, how would you increase footfall, uh, particularly with the younger generation? Um, and then in a related question, how can you improve contacts and support from the LEA and local schools? Right, so taking the first one about young people, um, I mean, we've already got a sort of foot in the camp with this already, because in fact, one of the pictures I have up here is very much on that point. Um, one of the projects we're doing at the moment is on our costume gallery and represent, re representing that. And we're working with uh, young people in schools and also in colleges as a form of co-curation. In fact, it's almost like a test case of what we will do with this project or with this bigger project going forward. So there are, there are various there are various schemes in what, what, what's called an activity plan, which sort of lists off lots of different community engagement projects. So one, one thing, for example, is we want to do an intergenerational oral history project where we will get young people um, working with older people talking about the past um, and sort of phrasing it within the things that interest them. So a lot of this is also about sort of steering things towards what the community, what young people are interested in finding out about, about our, our history. So that's, I think, that element. Now, as I say, there are numerous strands to that, and it's all funded through the Heritage Fund project. And uh, there will also be people employed, both separate sort of uh, freelancers, but also there will be a, a, a specific role appointed, uh, a project officer who will oversee the delivery of this activity plan and also that engagement with those particular groups. Um, so yeah, young people is a very key part of this, as are families with young children as well, absolutely key audience. Um, in terms of the local authority, well, we're an independent museum, but we are partly funded by, by Wiltshire Council. So we do have a really good working relationship with, with the council already. And they've been um, very supportive of this project. They've written a letter of support for it and been with us actually all of the way. In fact, one of the very obvious ways they're going to help us is in terms of the fundraising, not by actually granting us any money directly, but they've agreed to underwrite the outstanding funding up to the total of half a million pounds if we don't succeed in raising the funds so that's absolutely critical it's a very visual very open sort of sign of their support we are actually hoping that of course we'll raise all the funds and we won't have to borrow any money from the council but that evidence is there in writing in fact the cabinet of the council agreed that um, and in terms of local the local education authority well again going back to the um, activity plan coordinator it will be part of their role to sort of build networks and partnerships with with local organisations. So we have obviously Wiltshire Council and what they deliver to local schools, but also we have um, the Salisbury City Council who also have a very active kind of learning and engagement team working with local communities, for, for example, in the Friary in Salisbury, which is one of the most deprived areas in the city, and also Bemerton Heath, um, just to the west of the town centre, which is another area of deprivation. So their work there with those people who are already engaged in those communities will be really important. Thanks, Adrian. Um, a couple more related questions. Sarah asks, will the museum be completely closed during the development works? Um, and David asks, when will the new galleries be open to the public? Uh, yes, um, and I touched on, in terms of the opening, of course, 2024 is the key date. So in terms of the timetable, um, we've got a End of, end of 2022, we'll appoint the main contractors to the building work. 2023 is the year of disruption. 2024, hopefully the beginning of 2024, but we all know how these things go, uh, will be when the new museum will open. Um, in terms of 23, that will be the year, as I say, of disruption. What ideally we would like is to remain partially open because it would be you know, awful to fully close because we'd lose profile and lose membership. Um, it'd be lovely to actually keep some of the museum open. Obviously the Wessex Gallery is not going to be impacted by the building works. Temporary exhibition space isn't going to be hugely impacted and nor is the shop. Cafe area will potentially be impacted. So there's going to clearly need to be some phasing, some careful phasing and how, how we do all of this. Um, so my hope is that we can remain open for as much as possible. But the fact remains there's some quite major work that needs to be done, for example, on our power supply which as you can imagine is going to have some kind of knock-on effect on the entire building so so there may be some periods when we have to fully shut but if we do i'd like at the moment to keep those to as short a period as possible and as i say th this project obviously impacts on lots of different areas so you could see actually perhaps some micro phasing of it 
with it having impacts on different parts of the building at a different time and maybe some bits opening before others. Um, but as I said, at the moment, that needs to be worked out in a little bit more detail. And to be honest, we won't really know until we've got the, you know, the contractors on board and how they'd like to play things. Because clearly the other thing is we want to do it for as little money as possible, whilst also maintaining our profile and keeping people coming through the door. So I want everything, basically. Um, a question from Charles. Uh, he said you mentioned the giant possibly coming out um, and asked, is, is it in a condition um, where it could actually be a part of public celebrations again? I think that's something we need to look at. I mean, he's, he's, he's been heavily remade. His cloak, if he's wearing now, was made back in the 1980s when, we, when he came into the museum here in King's House. So that is not original. The framework inside has been pretty much rebuilt. Um, the only bit of him that might be original is the head, but even that was heavily conserved back in the 1980s. Um, he'd built up quite a lot of layers of sort of darkness and accretion on his face. Those were all sort of like shellac almost. That was all cleaned off. And we found, rather the museum found at the time underneath this sort of lighter complexion, sort of Northern European appearance. He looked quite Moorish actually, quite North African in, if you look at earlier photographs of him. So he is in pretty stable condition. Clearly the issue um, is making sure that we don't have any accidents with him and also what the weather conditions are like. Um, you know, unfortunately, actually, if it was a blaring kind of really sunny day, that probably wouldn't be a great time to take him out. Um, we'd probably want a cloudy, slightly overcast day again. I'm being very specific here um, because you don't want too high light levels on him. But on the other hand, um, I'd also feel this, this urge that we need to do something with him because he is a community figure. Thank you. And um, I think our last question, unless anybody else wants to kind of fire some more questions out. Um, Alison said she's very excited and enthused by your talk. Thank you very much. Um, if we want to donate, how do we do so? Ah, well, the very straightforward way of doing that is to go to our Just Giving page. And you will find that if you go onto our website and literally on our banner at the top, there is a this, this fort, that painting I showed you. Click on that, gives you a little description of the project. And at the bottom, you can click through to the Just Giving page where you can make a donation. Thank Brilliant. You. Brilliant, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for that offer. Thank you, everybody. I mean, thank you for your generosity, everybody for um, you know uh, being with us tonight. Um, equally for the generosity to those who have um, given to this um, because thanks to so many people, it's just been incredible, it's been really great. But Kate, thank you for everything that you've done. Adrian, thank you very much for yet another really great talk and um, you've enthused us um, yet again. So um, really looking forward to seeing this. And if people would like to keep in touch, please do, um, you know, let us know, email us and you know, we can keep you in touch as we go into this and show you things physically as we come out of lockdown. And for any of you, excuse me if there's a little plug, if any of you would like another um, talk on the 12th of, um, uh, of of May, I'll be doing a talk on the original James Bond artist who was a man called Richard Chopping, who did Ian Fleming's first covers. Ian Fleming was buried in um, Wiltshire and um, hence the connection that we've got. And um, we've got an amazing set of stuff from the archive of Richard Chopping, as well as some of the um, original drawings from the uh, Bond works that uh, we'll be putting on display in our temporary exhibition. So thank you everybody very, very much indeed. Thank you for being with us. We've really enjoyed it and hope to see you soon. Good night.